So this is the the pre roll. But um, so yeah, man, it was a it was a late night. Like I said, it wasn't even necessarily um, like you know, like because we were drinking. It's just we were talking. Hold on, and my mom's calling me. Hello. Hold on, <laughs> mom, you're live. Hello. Hello. Yes. Me. I know your name comes up when you call me. <laughs> so for sure you're not gonna get the empty arena talk. Correct. With what? She got married. Dun, dun, dun. You heard it live here first. Hey, Mom, just so you know, you're on the podcast right now. Oh, <laughs> 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 oh sorry. <laughs> are you going to cut me out or are you going to keep me in? No, you're, you're staying. No, you're staying. I can go to talk and dance, you know? No, you're staying. All right, well, we'll talk about it after the show. All right, have a good show. Yeah, all right, bye. What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Second City Kids podcast, episode number 116. 116. You know, I think it might be because we went through like an underprivileged podcast phase, but I forget how good that intro is sometimes, man. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for you sure. Know? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it rips. But, man, my podcast, Breaking Family News now, man. Breaking, <laughs> you heard it first here, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. Yeah, literally, you guys found out as I found out. <laughs> I guess my aunt got married. So, congratulations to her. Uh, hope I was well. And I know, like, they, like I said, they're expecting. So should be interesting moving forward. Interesting dynamic. Things are weird. Very but cool. It, it is what it is. So we are back on a beautiful day. 70 uh, degrees. Yeah, on the south side of Chicago, Illinois. And uh, yeah, we're here and we're ready to go. You may have noticed that I'm not as snotty as I was last week or coffee. Yeah, or, would you do some push-ups before the show? No, I'm just I'm getting better. But like in the middle of the week, I felt like death, you know. Yeah. So, um, But we're back and feeling a little bit better. With that being said, how was your week, buddy? My week, uh, it was okay. Yeah, I got no real complaints. Mm-hmm. Uh, we kind of were talking before the show. We were at Nikki's last night. Always a good time with them. Yeah. And uh, I feel like I, I really appreciate his parties because you could have a, a good, engaging conversation with a good chunk of the people there. Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, man. So we, we, we actually got a... We, we scraped a topic from one of last night's conversations on the yeah. day that we'll get into later. But yeah, man, my week is all right. What about yourself? Uh, it was pretty good. Like I said, outside of being... Dead and uh, I don't know if I told you, but on Tuesday, Tuesday or no, it might have been Wednesday. Wednesday night we had to rush Elisana to the emergency room. Oh, what happened? Because her temperature spiked. She was like really hot and like hot potato, hot potato, hot. hot, Because she got what I got, so she's got that little virus. So she's fine. She's a little snotty these days still, but um, so she was like um really hot. And I turned on the lights in her room because I picked her up and she was like covered in sweat. So I picked her up and she was like beet red. And she threw up a little bit. We're like, oh, shit. Yeah, so we had to take her um, early in the morning. Didn't get done uh, until like 8 o'clock in the morning. And I like had to start getting ready for work. So that was like a super long day. Fortunately, she was okay. Just needed to get some fluids in her to bring her her temp down. Stabilize. Yeah, and then she was fine. But, uh, man, that was a fucking long day that in the middle of the week. Yeah, man, she could be scary. Especially yeah. Especially for like first-time parents and stuff. Absolutely. So, uh so yeah, I mean, I mean, like I said, me and Adrian are not paranoid, so we couldn't help ourselves, so we had to take her just to make sure. Hey man, it's better to be a, a little on the Safe side, side of caution, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Especially when you're kids, you know, you can't fuck around with that type of stuff. Yeah, good but, shit. But other than that, man, that's that was my week. Um, other than being sick, like I said, we got it. We got a very gentle uh, agenda today. Mostly yeah. music talk, but let's start plowing through. So we got uh, movies and TV. Yeah. So we got a trailer for the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. Yep. Um, I got. A question for you. So you saw, you seen the trailer, right, and all I that did. stuff. Do you think Jim Carrey's back hurts from carrying this fucking movie? Shit, right? Um, it's it's funny that you say that because I love Jim Carrey, but I don't think the Doctor Egghead slash Doctor Robotnik is a good good fit. You know, you don't think so? What's your reasoning behind that? I don't know. Maybe I I could be wrong. Granted, it's been a while since I played a Sonic game, and Sonic being one of my favorite franchises probably of all time. But oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's been a while, but um. I feel like Dr. Egghead slash Dr. Robotic because they can't pick which one they want to roll with on any given day um, is more menacing than funny. I could be wrong, but um, that was always my impression of him. Have I, you not seen The Mask? The Mask? Oh, well, yeah. No. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that kind of pulls the whole uh, charismatic, menacing bad guy really well with Jim Carrey. I think he does that pretty solidly. No, I know, but I don't know. I, 
I, just the vibe I got was more funny than anything else. Um, you think maybe that's what they were going for with I mean, this initial trailer? I mean, I, I guess it could that could be it, but I don't know. I just guess, I guess we have to see the execution of it all just to see how everything. Would you have cast for that role? Yeah, Joey uh, Diaz. I honestly, <laughs> 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 um, I wouldn't even made it. Yeah, that's a whole other issue with this movie. Yeah. Um, Sonic has come to the point where it's a self-realized almost satire because like the current Sonic series makes pokes fun at everything that it is, right? Yeah. And we've kind of reached this weird point where it's hard to have a good game adaptation of Sonic, a new good game adaptation. And now we're at the point where there's a movie that nobody asked for. And of course, there's all this backlash with how he looks, the Horchog looks and stuff. The what? The Horchog. <laughs> but... Dude, it's kind of rough around the edges, man. It is really rough around the edges. Yeah, it's like a, they couldn't um, pick a tone, right? And it, it's funny to me because let, let's talk about how he looks. Address that real quick and kind of address the follow-up to that as well. He looks like a man in a hedgehog suit. Yeah. Really. He doesn't he, look like Sonic. He doesn't look great, number one. Number two, he's wearing Nikes, which just throws me off. I just have this this uh, weird um, mental picture of him going to like a Foot Locker and buying his Nikes. Product placement. Yeah, but I'm just saying. But... From from the, the 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 outlook of being logical, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, like I said, Sonic's one of my favorite characters. I remember playing um, the Sonic Pinball game on Sega Genesis. It was like the second game I ever played. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I don't want to totally hate it because uh, I think it's gonna be. F- I think it'll be a fun movie, a fun stupid movie. Um, you know, and it's not like Sonic is in his heyday anymore. Anyways, you know. So, if anything, if it helps people play the games, go back and look at those good good old times, then I think it's done its job. Well, they did announce that they're going to go back and redesign Sonic the character. Yeah, that was the second thing I want to address. Because yeah. the internet fucking threw a shitstorm over how he looked. I mean, it, he looked bad, don't get me wrong, but I, I it, for me, it's just par from the course. I mean, look what the Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Mutant Turtles look like, right? They looked horrible uh, in, in their reboot and all that, and they didn't address that, really. You know, I don't think they looked as bad as this, though. Like, ah. I, I think mm-hmm. I think they were more so adapted, obviously, to the real world. And you got to kind of add some bulk. You got to kind of add some nice shadowing and shit like that. Right. Yeah. But to, they didn't get like the overall like silhouette or the overall look of them bad. I think it was like the, the devil was in the details with that movie. You know, but in this, like you look at it and you're like, that's not Sonic yeah. on first impression, you know, and I feel like that was the issue with this kind of thing. I mean, what would, what would have been so bad? I mean, like I said, they, they are fixing it, which is good. I'm glad that they took constructive criticism with this because it would have been real easy for a director of a movie to be like, well, fuck off. Don't see it then. You know what I mean? Uh, but to me, it lends me to think that he has a little bit of respect for the character. Right. And maybe it was a creative choice that he took and, you know, it didn't work out. So they still have time. Let's fix it. Right. Uh, like I said, but I think it would have been real easy for a director to be like, fucking grow up, move on. You know what I mean? But uh, he didn't do that. So I, I kind of like that about him. Kind of uh, makes you wonder if it was scripted. No, nah, I don't think it was all no. that. No, because I think uh, they would much rather have the positive press than the negative press. And you could say, well, you know. Well, no pre- press is bad press. Yeah, there, I know that. But I think it'd be uh, I think it'd be much more prudent for the internet to be uh, at first to have a, a, a positive initial impression because now regardless if the movie's good or not which jury's out uh i think it, at the very least you'd want people to be like well that looks cool at least you know it's supposed to be like well it looks like shit and now people whether the movie's bad or not are going to be like well it's shit because of the initial impression right they're going to go into that with that mentality yeah and i think it's a good analysis on it i um here's my thing man why why is everybody doing live adaptations now i don't know a lot of anime I enjoy have been getting live adaptations, and most of them have been garbage. Yeah. Like the Ghost in the Shell movie that with Scar Jo. What yeah. was that last year? Two years ago, probably. Two, at this oh, point. yeah. That, if, if the Ghost in the Shell name wasn't on it, it would have been an okay movie. But because it kind of almost like insulted that franchise to me, I couldn't do it. You it, know? It, it, because that, those type of things carry weight. You know what I mean? Like you can't just. It's a name. Yeah, you know, you it's a brand. You can't just tack on a name and hope that's going to work out. You know, these things carry weight. And you and especially can't. if you, like, grew up with that show. Like, The Ghost in the Shell, the, the OG movie from 96. Oof. Yeah, but the OG movie, it, it's, like, a lot of, like, deep philosophical shit, you know? It's not just your typical, like, go in there, hack and slash, like, anime. It, it was, like, a lot of shit that, like, left you thinking afterwards, and that was the beauty of that. It, yeah. sh- it was one of the earlier movies that showed that there could be a lot of weight to this medium. Mm-hmm. And I think it, that's part of the reason that, like, mainstream, it's it serialized and mainstreamed in the West because those early, like, Adult Swim days... 
you, you remember they like get past a certain time but once you got past robot chicken family guy that shit midnight comes around they're playing anime man and i feel like that played a big role in this yeah and at least that movie was a key movie in my like development into this world but no it, it's a brand name you know and i i think sonic's at this point where people are expecting the worst you feel me yeah. like people realize that it's hard to make a good sonic game now and so they're like, you want to do a live action movie? Fuck it. Just do it. Why do you think that is? Why do you? Th well, because Mario translates. Mario still translates, right? To, to modern gaming. Why, what is it about Sonic that he doesn't translate? And granted, this is a gaming conversation, but whatever. You know, why doesn't Sonic translate? Game wise or movie wise? Game wise. Game wise. Because um, I think Nintendo takes very careful and well-planned steps to make sure Mario stays alive for another 20, 30 years. I don't think he's going anywhere. No. And that's what it is. Because you look at, obviously, like, what's your favorite Mario game off the top of your head? 64? Probably, yeah. 64 is pretty pretty proper. You remember when that game game came out? Yeah. And they transitioned from, like, the 2D platformer, mm -hmm. when the Koopas, into this whole 3D experience. That was yeah. gorgeous, right? Yeah. My favorite is, personally, Yoshi's Island 2, because I have, like, I don't know, oh. 600 hours on that game. That was wow. Like, I have... I have all three safe slots filled up, and I still have my original Game Boy Advance that my dad bought me wow. with that OG copy. Wow, that's dope. Yeah, that's what like one of my treasured possessions. But um, and then Mario Galaxy came out, right? And it kind of took uh, a lot of what made sixty four good, right? Just three D platformer, this and that. But they added on top of it. They added layers. They added good stuff. They modernized the graphics. They did all the story. all the pretty stuff, the story, right? And then uh, what's the latest one? Mario Go was it the one that dropped last year where he throws the hat? That's Odyssey. Mario Odyssey. There we go. Yeah. And what Nintendo is doing is that they're building this really nice casserole of Mario stuff because they took on your foundation. It's still the Mario Brothers, Mario, Luigi, Bowser, Daisy, Peach, Peach. all the good stuff. Right. So, yeah. And then they build the gameplay on top because it still feels like a Mario game, but they're making it modernized. They're making it feel new when it's really just a newer implementation of older <laughs> game mechanics. And that's what it is. Sonic, I don't think. Well, first of all, in my opinion, I don't think that fast gameplay of like those early like zipping through uh you know grassy hill or whatever that level was mm -hmm. i don't think that emerald hills emerald hills there we go i don't think that shit just does it right enough and that's my opinion but i'm sure if sega sat down and took the time and they said we need to rebrand and reface the sonic games i'm sure they could do something wonderful like i heard um I'm not that big of a Sonic fan, but my buddy is, and he said Sonic Generations wasn't that bad. Sonic but, Generations was good. Sonic Heroes was good. Even but, uh, Shadow the Hedgehog was good. But but that's the thing, it wasn't that bad. Is the key word is mm -hmm. the is like the underlying text. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mario Odyssey, people love it. Yeah. Whereas Galaxy Mario, people love it. You know, and that's kind of the thing where, um, we're, we're, I feel like we've had this conversation before. There's a point where, uh, artists, developers, makers, producers, whoever you are, content creators some of them settle and it shows because like i said mario's not going anywhere but if you told me that in five years sega said okay sonic is a legacy character but here's somebody new i'd be like yeah that'd probably be the right move uh, i don't know about that my man ah uh, man I, I think the sonic franchise is in a very rough spot and there needs to be like a revival not on our part not on the audience part but on their part they need to do their part first to bring to reel us back in that's the issue right now as, as how it pertains to me. Huh. Interesting. And you know what I mean? Like we always say that like, oh, X takes care of Y. I just don't feel like Sega's doing enough to take care of the Sonic name because I love Knuckles. I love Big the Cat. I think Big the Cat's fucking hilarious. And I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. But why should I still care about it? And that's the thing. I mm -hmm. loved, uh, you ever play Sonic Riders? Yeah. Grossly underrated. Yeah. We need to bring that back. Don't even bring it back as a full game. Bring it back as a mini game in the next Sonic game. Think yeah. about how great that would be. Yeah. yeah I don't know. That's, that's interesting. I don't know. I mean, like, I've never really put much thought into it and why Sonic never sustained because obviously when in the 90s, when the Genesis and all this stuff came out, he was he was toe-to-toe. -to -toe. He, yeah. he was toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mario as far as being like the face of gaming at the time. Um, that could be just Sega going down. When Sega went down, Sonic kind of went down with it, which... I, I believe that to a certain extent. You know what I mean? I think um, the death of Sonic as a uh, hardware developer definitely didn't help. Uh, but he had some good games on the GameCube too, though. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. But look at what Nintendo has done with Mario. You obviously have your throwbacks. You have Mario Party, Mario Kart. You have Odyssey Go. Um, all this shit we just talked about. Look at that. What does Sonic have? The, the, the one or two Olympics games, right? The Sonic Olympics? But that was a crossover with Mario, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And then you have like all these one-off oddball games. Whereas Nintendo realizes that 
serialization, uh, improvement, and all this stuff that goes into it. And they're just taking better care of it. It's like if you had two house plants, right? Both of them you bought at the same size, but one of them you trimmed, you fed, you watered. It had great sunlight, great exposure, and you re you seriously put some time to take care of it, that one's going to blossom and flourish. Whereas the other one, where if you kind of half-ass it, well, your results are going to be half-assed. Hmm. I wonder. Yeah. That is interesting. Like I said, I never really put that much thought into it. You know? But it is what it is. I mean, uh, hopefully, like I said, if anything else, if it helps bring back some of the, the old nostalgic vibes that the Sonic have, like, you know, Sonic had. And I know they had that, what did they have a couple years ago? They had like a Sonic kind of thing that we talked about on the show too. I don't remember. Maybe that's just a testament on how well that's going. But um, there you go. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. So that's Sonic. I mean, we'll see what happens. I guess. Uh, hopefully they fix them up a little bit, make them look a little bit better, and we'll see what happens moving forward. Very cool. Next up, some sad news. Obviously, uh, me and Gabe, being lifelong fans of the franchise, Mr. Peter Mayhew, Sir Peter Mayhew, uh, passed away. For those of you who may not know, he is uh, the person who played Chewie. Through all the Star Wars movies, right? He he was. Uh, I believe he passed the torch, Nate. He passed the torch to Nate. a like a Scandinavian basketball player. Okay, so um, yeah, he played Ch- Chewie since the beginning of time. Very tall fellow. Uh, how old you said? 72, 76? He was seventy four. Seventy four. Seventy four years old. And I, me and Gabe talked about it off air. Uh, we texted about it. I'm like, well, giants don't live long, and um, you know that is what it is. What can you do? He was definitely in that giant range. I don't think he was like. I you know I can't speak. Of it like that, but I don't think he was quite in that range where it would cause serious medical problems. I'm sure the dude had back issues. Don't get me wrong. Well, I, I think that they said that there was like a thing that people over like six ten, like the world's not built for them. You yeah, know what I mean, absolutely. So I mean, like, like, like look at Andre the Giant. He died. Oh, he, what was he like under forty? Right. Yeah, I mean, let me look because I, you know, let me let me look because that, that was the first example I brought up. And then the world's tallest man died like right around thirty. So it, it's really like amazing to me that like Peter Mayhew was seven two, dude. He was he was tall. He seven was a, two. He was a yeah, giant. That's, no, that's massive. Yeah, he's a giant. That's uh, like <laughs> it's like a foot and a half away from your ceiling here. Yeah. Uh, let me look up Andre real quick because Andre died when he was. Oh, excuse me. Um, it's kind of sad we don't know this off the top of our heads, right? I, I One of the wrestling greats, really. He wasn't even. Hold on, I, I, I'm, my, my math is bad at the moment. Um, Forty six to he died in ninety three. 46 to 93? Yeah. How was that? 46. So he's 47 years old, if I'm not mistaken. 46, 46, 46. 46. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. 46. He, so make, so that's 50. like, dude, that should be like, at, by today's standards, that should be when you're having your midlife crisis. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. The, well, the, he had that, that thing where his heart kept on growing. Yep. So, you know, it is what it is. But, um, yeah, man, like it's just really sad to see him go, obviously, um, you know. But... That's not to say that he didn't live a good life. Absolutely, yeah. Because he definitely reaped the rewards from everything that George Lucas and the franchise and all the fans did. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, those mannerisms of Chewie are very you know important to him. Like the way he walks around and interacts with you know the other characters on, on screen. Obviously, he didn't do the speaking roles for him or whatever, the noises of him. But, you know, it's important to have kind of those mannerisms. It's kind of like... It's my, like the whole Michael Myers and yep, the castle thing that, we talked that, about. That was about. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Um, so... Sad to see him go. May he rest in peace. Yeah. I mean, and may, um, may the force be with you. May the force, right? may the force be I with you. I think there was a Yoda quote where it was like, do not be sad that he's dead. Be happy that he is one with the force or something along those yeah, lines. Something like I probably that. butchered that really bad, but yeah. that's the general gist of it. Or you could take the line from Dumbledore where he's like, don't pity the dead, pity the living. That's yeah, pretty good. Go. That's pretty metal. Yeah, that's pretty well, good. What was your, uh, to close out, what was your favorite Chewie moment in like any of the movies? Or I got mine in the top of my head. Favorite Chewy moment. Go with yours. I'll sure. think about it. Uh, I think actually he has a lot of like really proper moments in the OG trilogy and he even shines in like Revenge of the Sith. He was probably good in there. But my favorite actually comes from episode seven where Han dies and he goes fucking yeah. ape shit yeah. and he starts like plowing through these stormtroopers and you just felt the agony yeah. in that in that growl, you know? And that's that says a lot because he, he doesn't have real dialect, you know, at least to us. Yeah. But you felt it. You know, you saw the distress. Yeah. That would probably have to be it for me as well because he was just so fuck. Like you said, he was pissed the fuck off and he went nuts. And he's like, you know what? Every, every motherfucker in this in this fucking terminal is going down. He fuck when he dropped the bombs on them and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd agree with that. That's definitely a big moment. I did like him in Revenge of the Sith. Um he was kind of interesting probably one of the one of the better moments really yeah of revenge of the sith getting to see kashik and mm-hmm. its glory um there was that and there's something else that escapes me um moment. another one in seven actually when he's flying the millennium falcon solo and it's like it's the view of the cockpit and you see that the other seat's empty yeah that was brutal yeah 
Man, that's crazy. Think about that. Um, I also like the the scenes uh, where um, what's it called? They're in the desert and uh, what's it called? Um, oh my god, Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi, and he's talking to Chewie like, and uh, he's like Boba Fett and that type of thing. And I don't know. I, I, he had a lot, he was like comic relief, especially after the whole uh, you know Han dying and him coming back and kind of explaining to the like the like the medic like what <laughs> happened. And she's like, "Oh, you're a real hero." He's like, "Yeah, you know what I mean." That type of stuff. So you know. Chewie was one of the greats, obviously. Uh, man, we're, and we're just losing more people in that original cast as we're, time goes on. We got two from like the main crew. Yeah, gone. Yeah. Oh well, well two, I'm saying we got two left because we got Han and we got we got Harrison Ford and we got uh, Mark Hamill. Yeah, this is true. Harrison Ford's really old, man. Yeah, he's getting there. Hamill ain't, ain't, ain't too much younger than him either. He was the, the oldest of the crew. Hamill. But, or no, Ford. Yeah, Ford. Ford was the oldest of the crew. You ever see like throwback pictures of Harrison Ford? That is a good looking yeah. dude. Yeah, my my wife, she's like, Oh my god. I'm like, Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame her, but you know. So sad. May he rest in peace. Absolutely. All right. All right. So I actually um for those of you who listened to one fifteen last week, I put Rainbow Six on here and I I was like, Did you put it? No, did you put it? I'm like, I don't know. So I actually came across as to why I put it down. So on the test servers, um Ubisoft is implementing this new thing. And I'm bringing this up because I've mentioned this before. They're rewarding these bug catchers, these bug chasers. So if you report and document the bug, you'll get rewarded with this whole thing. And so you report one. Uh, I, I believe for the first three, you get like a unique charm that you use in the real game and like in competitive and stuff like that. And they're coming out with more and more rewards as it is. And I think that's just a really cool way of like giving back to the players. You know, granted, a charm isn't game changing and you're not going to have these dudes like beating the shit out of each other over like who reports what. But I think it is a nice gesture, and I think a lot of developers should be doing this, especially to um, a game that's really up there with the esports stuff now. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, like you said, you did you did bring this up, and um, I think if they re- rewarded anything more, that it would become kind of like a blood sport. You know what I mean on that front? So and the only other really thing that I could have thought of. And this is a unique charm. This isn't like one of the collection. This is completely unique to it. Um, is like an alpha pack because I feel like if you give any more than that, and you're gonna get a lot of people abusing the system here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, people crashing the game just for the sake of it, and then like trying to be like, oh, look what I did. Yeah, you know or like I mean? people making multiple accounts and submitting the documentation all at once and stuff. And yeah, you know, it, it's just one of those things where it's enough to 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 give back to the community that genuinely tries and tries to break those test servers and find every little nook and cranny in the game mm-hmm. but it's not enough for the overwhelming masses to be like yeah you know absolutely yeah and uh and oh yeah and you need an invite to even get into the test servers so very That's cool another thing but yeah i thought that was nice yeah nice absolutely gesture. real quick i wanted to um do a uh week two of mortal Kombat. Because- okay so this is uh officially a week and two days after the game dropped yeah um what do you think now that you've kind of marinated on it um, it's funny because you know you were you and I were pretty critical about the story, but everybody else seems very overwhelmingly positive about it. And I'm like, man, did me and Gabe miss something? Uh, I don't I, think you know what it is. I think people are giving it a pass because it's a fighting game at the end of the day. Because a, a lot of these other franchises don't give a shit about their story. Yeah, and or well, I don't want to say don't want to give a shit. It's not as intricate. It's not as like this or that. And NetherRealm Studio puts a lot of work into the story, and that's part of the attraction of Mortal Kombat. You get a full-fledged campaign. You get a full-fledged story, even though it's only maybe six or ten hours, whatever it is, but, right? Yeah, which is more than most games. Yeah, you're right. Whereas a lot of these other games, you get the little note card with the character biopic, and that's it, right? Yeah. And I feel like we didn't let that slide. We didn't, we didn't let the story slide because it was a fighting game. Yeah. But we, I feel like a lot of people are just there for the really nice polished multiplayer, which is to be praised. Because it is good, but they're ignoring the pile of dung that's 10 feet away. You know, that's one menu option away. Yeah, I see some of that. But, like, legitimately people who, like, care about the franchise, because I think our love for the franchise is well known on this show. Um, But people who are even more invested than me and you talking, like, people who's like, this is their livelihood, or, like, talking about, like, how well, how they liked how it ended and stuff like that, I'm like... I don't know, cause like I was, I went into the, cause I went into the video of them talking about it, and I'm like they're probably gonna have the same issues that I did, and they were like overwhelmingly positive about it. And I don't know if, like I said, it could be just me being overcritical. It could be me and you being overcritical, cause we, we, we that's how we are. But um, I don't know. I think there's something we might, we might have missed. Maybe just missed the mark for us as people. That could be it too. I think maybe we were looking for something that wasn't there. Yeah, that could be it. You and I, we put it, we. 
like amp we, ourselves we, up. We, we are film and music guys first and foremost. Yeah. And not to say that this campaign wasn't artistic, but I don't think it met the criteria that we were looking for. Yeah. Maybe we treated the campaign as a film. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, so there's that. Um, so obviously they gave away the currency, right? Burned through that really fucking fast, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a patch update for all you yes. guys who don't know. Ed Boon addressed the uh, gear issue and the whole loop, quote unquote loot box issue. They're not yeah. calling it that. But yeah, they dropped like all this free currency and all that shit on Friday night, I believe. And they, yeah, they adjusted the values that you earn. Uh, that type of stuff, which definitely helps. I will say it definitely has helped the game. Uh, move it on that front. Um, so there was that. But basically what I really wanted to talk about was um, kind of what I've learned. Right. Um, so we talked about the game being very different. And uh, it is in every way. And um, the more I experiment with it, the more I like it, dude. I, I like the fact that these characters feel so fucking different. The, the big thing I noticed, um, like big picture wise, is that MKX was like 50-50 footsie combo. So like you got to know your footsies. But a lot of the time, some of these characters had just stupid reach or the frame data was just so broken. Well, maybe not broken. You could very easily take advantage of a lot of the characters' frame data and stuff like that where it came down to your opponent slips or if you get you know a nice window of opportunity, you start executing your 30-hit combo for 40% or whatever it is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas this game is a lot more like, I'd even say 65-35, 65 on the footsie side. Yeah. Because you really got to know your positioning in this yeah, game. Yeah, know you, your range. If you fuck up... Man, by even like two frames, you're donezo. Yeah, you know, because the punishing in this game is brutal. It yeah. is unforgiving. Yeah, you definitely have to be paying. You have to know the dance. It's, it's a lot more about knowing the dance as opposed to like, knowing your combos. Yeah, really. know, knowing your combos. It's it's all about making the punish punishments count. Punishments count uh, because there's scenarios, especially with the crushing blow mechanic, which we didn't really talk about at all last week, which has really kind of changed how combos are laid out, the dynamics of combos and stuff like that, and when to use them and when not to use them. Because now your combos. A lot, a good chunk of them have a clear, defined start, middle, or end, or yeah. maybe even all three. Because back in the day, it was well, open up with your back down four. Yeah. But now it's like, well, you got to lead in with a blowing, you got to lead out with a blowing, or you got to do it somewhere in the middle and can follow up. Yeah, and it's, it's all, I think it's about throwing out because you you you're, you know this about me. I'm really good with uh, low kicks as far as like keep getting them the keep away. Yeah, to open up. Something because once I throw a couple of those out, you're expecting them, and then it just opens up the the, the gameplay, and that's what Phil kind of was harping on uh, in the group chat that the especially with Sonya, that low kick is so fast that it just opens up all kinds of options, and I think that is emphasized in this game. Um, while before it was kind of just kind of a um, mechanic that maybe the um, small percentage of the your, your professional fighters would know about yeah. it, whereas nobody else would really give a shit. Yeah, and I think. It could be just maybe the tutorial is so good in this game and like uh, the practice mode is so good in this game that the overall IQ of the average player has increased. You know what I mean? And it's making it a lot more fun. Me and Phil, I told you this, me and Phil had probably one of the best sets I've had against anybody ever, just constant back and forth. He had Luke Kane, I had Sonya. And we were you going, would play Luke Kane. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, and we were just going at it and uh, learning a lot. He's like, man, because he was talking about his brother, how his brother's played. Because Phil's brother's really good. I've played in Justice Against him. He's a, he's a good player. He knows what he's doing. Uh, he's like, man, he's like, I feel he's like, I learned from my brother. He's like, but he's like, I feel like it's more just like an ass kicking. Like I get my ass kicked and then I have to learn from that while you is a proper spar match. Yeah. It's like a balance. You know what I mean? You're like, it's, it's the constant tug of war that he's learning from. Um, so I, it's probably the most fun I had. Like I said, I was physically sweating, uh, during that set because it was like so good and well, well-rounded. So, yeah, man, um, we, we kind of touched on it, but this is easily the most complex MK game we've gotten to this point. Yeah. Um, in a good way, you know. There's a there's definitely a lot of setup that goes into these games. Mm-hmm. Well, into this game in particular, excuse me. So like I said, that footsie, that dance, that should be the first thing that you have to pick up, and it should it's probably going to be the last thing you master absolutely. in this game. Absolutely, and that's the beauty of it. Yep, absolutely. So I just wanted to give my opinions a week two because I've grown to love it more, uh, especially from the gameplay side. I think they've yeah. done such M- a mirror finish, really good, really yeah, good. Because so good, they might have blown the story for us, and we're not going to get back into that. But the gameplay is just so buttery smooth yeah you it, know silky silky smooth so and i'm learning and i'm, I'm excited to it's important to, to play against some other people um get some sets going with among my friends because i don't even know i like playing online and stuff like that but there's the douchebag and i played an aaron black today who was just like the most obnoxious guy in the world shooting and just the constant lows and stuff like that like 
I wanted to play against my friends. That's like the the most fun with Mortal that's, Kombat. That's where you um, that's where you should scale for. Yeah, you know, because if you're too good, nobody's gonna want to play with you. At least yeah. with, amongst your friends. Yeah. But then if you're that at that level, then you're gonna have to deal with like tournament guys. Yeah. And those dudes, oh, you don't want to deal with. Yeah, them. I don't want to fuck around because I I am not that level. But I think it was safe to say for a long time I was always the best among. You were friends. like the above average. Yeah. Player, but now it's kind of weaned out and. Yeah. You're at that average line, which isn't a bad thing. It's yeah. probably a really good thing. Yeah, actually, because it makes me want to get better. Because there was moments where, especially with X, where I could kind of just walk away. You know, for months at a time, and then come back and kind of just pop back in. Yeah, play a round or two, and you'd be good. Yeah, and that stuff. It's not like that no more. So I'm glad because it's keeping me constantly motivated to play. Yeah, man. I remember um, the first time you like seriously whooped my ass. I was like, all right, I got to go in, and I got to learn. You know. Yeah. And that's kind of what made me strive to be better. But I haven't, um, I haven't touched. I'm, you're gonna like this story. I haven't touched Mortal Kombat X, and I still do kind of like the flashiness of it because I think there's a lot of enjoyment to that. Yeah, those big dumb combos. But the last time I played MKX, I got my ass handed to me by a Blood God Kotal Khan that pulled a 129% combo on me, and it was stupid stuns. I couldn't even get a, a hit in, and he just, you know, double flawless me, and I was like. All right, we're moving on to 11. <laughs> yeah, time, time to let, let's let this in the past. <laughs> but, but that's something I will miss of the game. Yeah. Um, just the kind of, it was nice. Yeah. You know, it was a bit obnoxious most of the time, but it was really nice when you pulled that off and it was really gratifying. Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, man, so that's a, a little update on MK11. I'm and, enjoying it. And, and real quick, um, as far as like the competitive aspect of it, it's so entertaining to fucking watch it. Oh, I totally forgot to mention, right? Um, so obviously I think, um, fuck, I forgot who it was. I think... A lot of people are going to be using uh, Noob Saibot as like a, like a combo or a counter to uh, Sonic Foxes are in black, if that's who he means. Because yeah. he has some nasty fucking ranging and yeah. those bounces and stuff. Yeah. I think people are going to learn and main Noob for that spectacle of the counter game. Yeah. Because it's so important now. The matchup is so stupid important. Yeah. And I, I don't know, just this kind of thought that came across my mind. Yeah. yeah like, like I said, watching it competitively, like I said, it's almost like watching a boxing match now as opposed to kind of just being flashy and fun, which absolutely it should be. But I kind of like the thinking man environment that this game has kind of harbored. So we'll see what happens moving forward. But that's all. that's that's the Mortal Kombat talk for the week. And we'll see what happens moving forward as far as us bringing it back. But with that being said, we have two games on here. Did you do? Did you bring out anything for the first one? Absolutely. I saw this on here, and I had my thoughts formulated. Okay. So here's where I stand on... So the game is best and worst covers. Mm-hmm. I think, especially when you're looking at the scene that we're in, the metalcore scene, that, that whole like genre, that whole umbrella of genres, really, I think a lot of them fall into that middle line where it's like, yeah, all right. And then I thought of a handful on both sides. Some of them that are really fucking good and some of them that are really bad. Okay. But I want you to go first because I'm pretty settled on mine. Okay. Um, so, I don't know, man. Uh, as far as covers, like, um, there was one that I've been wanting to do for years that I actually stumbled across a guy on YouTube doing. His name was Andrew Ben. ben I forget his fucking name. Bena, Bene, whatever the fuck his name is. I don't know how to say that. It's B-A-E-N-A. He did a cover of Dark Horse by um, uh, Katy, Katy Perry. Perry that was just like the sickest shit. But like, I like the concept of it, but the execution was a little iffy because the production was a little iffy. I don't know if that was an intentional choice. But uh, I think I did. I text you that that Katy Perry's Dark Horse they didn't have to go that hard. Yeah, for didn't it, have yeah. to. Go, didn't have to go that hard. It's one of my favorite Katy Perry songs, I think, easily. Uh, I miss the uh, like the warped to her Katy Perry aesthetic, man. I thought she did really well in that scene, but now she's kind of graduated. Has she? Because I feel like she's kind of fallen off the map a little bit there. She she's gone from opening up for bands like All Time Low and stuff like that to you know being massive and probably bigger than most of those bands combined. Yeah, that's and right. it's kind of sad to see her fall from her roots. Yeah, you know, like I was 2011 there. Katy Perry. Those that first album was really good. Um, I can't remember the fucking name of it, but I I like that. You know, that's, yeah. I think that's a good pop album. If more pop music was like that, we'd have be having a very different conversation now. Yeah, absolutely. So that was the, that was like that was one of the ones that was in between. As far as like, because th- what brought this up is because Memphis Mayfire did a cover to Faint by Lincoln yeah, Park. Yeah, that was interesting, and it fucking sucked. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> okay. Manny Wallace is a talented guy, absolutely. But his rap parts sucked. Here is the initial problem going into covering any Linkin Park song. You need the chemistry and you need the musical dynamic that Linkin Park has. And, I, dude, there's maybe, maybe like a handful of people, I think, that could pull off a Linkin Park cover. 
and it'd yeah. have to be a pretty nasty super group. Yeah. I think, you remember when we talked about how Denzel Curry covered Rage Against the Machine? Yeah. You give him faint, I think we're going to have a very good cover. Yeah. Um, I think, see, it's kind of rough because now I'm having like second thoughts on a lot of these bands that I think that could cover a Linkin Park song because then you got to have a different approach for each album that a Linkin Park song comes off of. Yeah. And faint is very in your face new metal. Uh, shit, dude, that song is my ringtone back in the day. Yeah. But Memphis Mayfire, I don't think they had the chemistry for it. I don't think they had the the chutzpah, as it, some people would it's, say. It's hard because, like you said, there, there, there's a very particular sound that Linkin Park brings along with them, right? Now, Linkin Park was one of the very few bands in the actual era of new metal that did it without it sounding hokey, right? It, yeah, it didn't sound like a gimmick. It, yeah. it sounded very natural and... You have a lot of people that say, yeah, I love Linkin Park, but I didn't fuck with new metal. I didn't like Slipknot, I didn't like Korn, I didn't like any of those bands, but I love Linkin Park. Mm-hmm. And that is a testament to what they've done. Yeah. So, because uh, like the, the rap and singing dynamic, screaming slash screaming dynamic, it's kind of hard to for one individual to pull off. So, I don't want to give him a pass on it because it was really bad. But uh, on the same tone, I've had, a, I have, we have buddies that, have done a cover of Faint that sounded really fucking good, and that's speaking with <laughs> speaking with Ghost. They did a great job covering Faint. It sounded Absolutely. great. Absolutely, um, I actually have it on my phone because he did such a good job. But um, so there was that. As far as like really good covers, uh, the Lincoln Park cover Nine Inch Nails Wish, and which was so fucking Perfect. fucking sick and disgusting. They did a great job with that. Um, let me think, because I know um, you know who's fucking doing a cover of Heart Shaped Box live Who? right under oath. Nice. Yeah, that's. A good fit. Yeah. If Manson can do it, then Under Oath can do it. Right. Um, so that's those are like a, on the better spectrum. It's bad covers. Psh, let me think. Because I'm sure there was some like off the wall shit and like on those pop versus punk. Pop that's punk actually things. where I went to find a, a good chunk of okay. my stuff. Let's go. Let's give it a shot. Okay. Then. So I'm going to go over the best ones first because I think these are the standout ones that did a really good job. A Day to Remember did a cover of uh, Over My Head by The Fray. Holy shit, that is such a good fucking cover. That song, it I don't want to say it reinvented that song, but it gave it such a new, well-needed paint job. You know, it's like when, fuck, dude. Like, like you remember when, when the Batmobile was like, it wasn't black, like that 60s Batmobile wasn't quite black. Mm-hmm. And then you saw the, the Tim Burton era where it was nice and sleek and like properly dark and this shit could blend in an alley. That's what it felt like. It felt like that new version of the Batmobile coming off of Adam West into, into the Tim Burton era. Hmm. It's such a fucking proper cover. And they did a version of Since You've Been Gone that is fucking way better than the original. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. The, the way a data member approaches covers, they treat the original song with respect, but they add a lot of pop flavor and crunch to the new version that they crank out. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important to do because a lot of these people are stepping on toes when they do covers. Yeah. You know how it is. Yeah. Because it, it, doing a cover song is the easiest thing you could do as a new band, a new emerging band, to fill some set time. We're going to do a cover. Yeah. This is the easiest thing you could fucking do. It's a pre-written thing. You just you play it, right? But they genuinely add on top of what what made these songs so great in the first place. Mm-hmm. And I got to address that because these guys kill it. Okay. And uh, I actually got a couple more on the good side. Um, I really like the August Burns Red cover of Wrecking Ball. And I think they did that song justice. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, same, same setup, man. August Burns Red and A Day to Remember. They've been around for shit as long as we've been jamming to this stuff, you know? Yeah, yep, yep, and yep. Same same kind of calm there. Um, and another one, I think uh, Ice Nine Kills, they're really proper cover animals by uh, Maroon 5. I think that is a good adaptation. Yeah. And that's why I like it. Because one of the bad ones I'm going to get into, you're going to see why I hate it. But they did a totally, like almost polar opposite spectrum. And they adapted it to the Ice Nine Kills sound. They adapted it to Spencer's vocals. And they did all the instrumentals really well. And they added that horror element to a song that wasn't necessarily about horror. It was about sex, right? Yeah. And I think that one's proper. Okay. Well, let's get into my bad ones. Limp Biscuit did a cover of Behind Blue Eyes. No comments there. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, I and the other one. one. So um, a band called The Cab. I don't know if you remember them. I wasn't really big into them. But okay. um, they did a cover of Rihanna's Disturbia. And I love that album. I love Rihanna. I love early Rihanna. Here's my thing. I don't think it's a bad cover on the surface, but it's a bad cover because they don't do anything to it. They just translate the music into instrumentals, and the dude from the cab's voice is like close enough in range to what Rihanna does in that song. And I just think it's a really it, 
it felt like amateur hour to me. And I, that's why I think it's a bad cover. Okay. Because like I said, these good covers, these great covers, like I did remember August Burns, Red Ice Nine Kills, those four I just covered, they had something. They had uh, a flair that wasn't there before. They add like a like like a family recipe. You know, there's something in there that you won't find in another recipe. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? They do that to it. And the cab just felt like really amateur hour cheap ripoff we need to fill some set time and that's why i hate it it's it's funny because like there's such a fine line with covers because it's like absolutely you can't you can't go too far because people are like well it's not even the same song you can't go too far off but you can't do the same thing because everybody's like well why does it exist there's such a fine line that you have to walk with that you know what i mean i have actually have another one that i want to talk about it's actually the same song covered by two different artists and one of them was really fucking good. The other one was really fucking bad. Sure, shoot me. And Fear and Faith did a fucking fantastic cover of Gangster's Paradise by Coolio. Fucking sick. It sounded so good. They played it live. It sounded fucking fantastic. They did such a great job with it. And in the same fucking breath, Fallen in Reverse did a cover of Gangster's Paradise by Coolio. And it sounded like fucking shit. So there, those. It's like it's funny because you see like two different variations of the same kind of song. And, and it, you're right. It really is a fine line because it, it's really... You're on the chopping block if you publish this thing on like Spotify, iTunes, if you're making money off it. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, we saw these like, you know, this local band last night and they covered, I don't know, like like a Linkin Park song, right? It wasn't great. But that's okay because they're trying to fill set time. But Mm -hmm. when you go out and you publish this and you're making money off it, that's when we're going to take a look at you under the microscope. Mm -hmm. Because those are two very different concepts. Absolutely. There's another one. Uh, actually, uh, uh, on the okay front, on the not so horrible. Uh, Bless the Fault of the cover of Dream On by Aerosmith. Dream think, on. think about that. Yeah. That's was that, that early Bless the Fault too? Yeah. Very cool. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't horrible. They did a pretty good job. And Dream On is one of the greatest rock songs of all time. Oh, easily. So you're, it's going to be very hard to kind of yeah, man. Like I said, that on. Th- there's a massive gap in this cover area where it's. Okay, like uh, Tech Attack did, I kissed the girl. It's okay. I don't think it's horrible. I don't think it's great. Um, Devil Wears Prada still fly towards the lower end, but it's not completely garbage. It's I would do that shit was so fucking hype, dude. When there, that shit there's came some out. redeemable qualities, and that's why there's such a massive one. gray zone here between the two trenches. There's this is no man's land, really, where it lands somewhere in here, and you're like, yeah, right. Yeah, you know, and that's kind of where we're at with this setup. Uh-huh. Speaking about the Devil Wears Prada, with Roots Above and Branches Below came out exactly ten years ago today. Wow. Yeah. So happy birthday, big boy! And uh, uh, Silent Planet made a really funny tweet about it. They're like, uh, "It's been ten years, you know, uh, since I knew a ghost or some shit like that." And I thought yeah, it was yeah. fucking hilarious. Qu- question. Sure. Uh, do you remember the first song you heard off of uh, Roots Above? Ah, uh, Sassafras. Oof. I think it was the opening track, too, if I'm not mistaken. It is. It was Sassafras was playing because I I remember I was in Hot Topic like not too long after this album dropped, and they were playing it, and I was like, "Mm, this is real tasty. And I think that's still one of my favorites off that album. They used to open up with Sassafras. They uh, they played it not at the Roots tour that I was at, but the show before that they played Sassafras. Huh. When they were doing just uh, like a regular tour with, fuck, who was there? Silent Planet was there, yeah. Silent Planet and Thousand Below was there, and they played Sassy Press. Very cool. Love that shit. Yeah. Ooh. So there's that. All right. Uh, nice and tasty. We got another game for you guys. Yeah, so this is actually a conversation that I developed last night. So our buddy David is uh, having his first real fight uh, soon enough, and so he was like, guys, can you help me figure out what song I should walk out to? Now, being wrestling fans on this podcast, we know that your walkout song is kind of a big deal. Yeah, well, there's that, and it's – um. The walkout song, and it's not just a fight thing, but like a baseball thing, and like these things, like it's your presentation. It's a presentation. So, like as far as like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about one that was really good. Like Paul Canerco from the White Sox had "Harvester of Sorrow" by Metallica, and that shit was like, ooh, proper. You, yeah, you fucking feel the ominous tones too. It's very important in the mentality of somebody who's going out to accomplish a job, like in the ring or something like that, right? You have something to, you have to accomplish. So. Like you said, uh, Dave's got the, got the fight coming. So he had some ones that were more up his alley, right? He talked about the, you know, he had the Eminem one, which I think he decided on, right? Yeah. Uh, what, what was the, which track was it? Do you I remember? forget what he said. It was a, like a throwback Eminem song. It worked for him, though. He was, we, we gave him like, I don't know, maybe 40 some like things like, listen to this, listen to this. And this song came out and he was just rocking and rolling. He's yeah. like, yeah, this is it. This is like, it. All right, yeah. man. Yeah, very fair enough. But with that, that kind of uh, I start sparked the conversation of what would your walkout song be if you were a fighter getting to the ring? Do you have one? settled because i i'm kind of i don't want to say i'm wishy-washy i got it narrowed uh, there's, there's, i got a few I, I got a few you can use so obviously i talked about the aleister black one right 
cop out. Yeah, it's a cop out because it's already a, a, a walk. It's out a song. good song though. It yeah. builds up greatly. Yeah, stuff like it's that. ominous and stuff like that. But with that, I have um, Oblivion Peaks by fucking Knocked Loose. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, that that's shit. That's oh yeah, that would fucking get you amped. Um, there was another one that I fucking had off the top of my head. That I'm thinking. Oh yeah, that's a really proper one. I'm fucking uh, ashamed I didn't think about that. Yeah, ah oh, shit. Fuck, I thought of one too. There was another one off the top of my head. Fuck, 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 fuck. You go, Gabe. You go. Before um, I, I think my like first and obvious choice would be literally anything off that Great American Ghost album uh-huh. because it's it's really built for this shit. Yeah. And I know I've been on that that hype train for Great American Ghost, and they're in the studio right now making a new album. Super excited. Mm-hmm. But I really like Ann Arbor. Uh, nothing left. Uh, any of those tracks, it, it it would it's a good like intimidation song, but I think it's important to keep yourself pumped. So you'd want to come out to something you like as well. Yeah, you know, and and I feel like those songs they'll just get me from zero to one hundred in like the blink of an eye. Or I'll uh, start like moshing against my steering wheel on the ride home. Bad motherfucker by Upon a Burning Body would That's be a, a good, good one, one too. Uh, We're to, gonna uh, talk about them later, but yeah, yeah, to the break of dawn that would be another good one by them. Um, shit, there was one that. Honestly, dude, like Guilty All the Same by Lincoln Park would be a fucking good one. So I like that one. I think that'd be a kind of a good one. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of better options in this genre of music, in my opinion. Yeah. And we did find some really good ones that are like throwback gangster rap and like yeah. modern day rap and stuff like that. That worked really well. But I think with this metal genre, you have a lot of leeway. Yeah. You could probably come out to a Memphis Mayfire song. Yeah. You could probably come out to a like a Must the Flames song, you yeah. know. And there's a lot of things here. There was one that I had in my baseball game and uh, my MLB in like in 2013, because you were able to um, take songs that you had downloaded onto your PlayStation and upload them to the the the, the, yeah. the game. I had uh, my walk up song for my baseball player was we sw- we slammed to Albatross the day we lost Kaylee Cost by nice. Chios with that fucking hit. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah, any Chios song yeah. would be a banger to walk yeah. out to. Uh, pigs is pigs every time I die. I think you could. Probably choose a nice chunk of their discography to walk out to. Yeah, that's some good stuff in there, man. So, uh, well, in the vein of celebrating 10 years, why not come out to, uh, uh, oh, shit. You know, I know a ghost. What is, what is the track name? Is uh, mine? Is mine's? No, that's, uh, no, that's, no, that's Danger oh, Wild Man. Danger Wild Man. There we go. Come out to Danger Wild Man. <laughs> oh, my God. You made me draw a blank on that I song. Oh. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty good. Oh, man. That'd be a good yeah. fucking song. Just start rolling around on that walkway. Yeah. Good shit. But yeah, that was a fun little thing we, we had a conversation about. I thought it was interesting because you, you see where people come from and you see what they're trying to front with their walkout song because yeah. it's very important. Yeah. It's, that, it's, that that walkout is stupid important. Yeah. that It's funny because uh, when CM Punk did the UFC thing, he came out to his wrestling song, which was... Uh, li- What's that called? Living Color of Cult of Personality, which is pretty good. It's, yeah. a, good, it's a good walkout song. You remember song. Uh, Eddie Guerrero's walkout song? I yeah. Die, I cheat. I steal. Yeah. I was telling people, I was like, listen, that, those are literally the first lyrics in his walkout song. Why are people surprised when he stabs you in the back? <laughs> right. <laughs> he had a, a darker version of his song, which I'll show you later, which started with like a cell phone ring. And it's like, can you feel the heat? And it goes into the shit, but it's like in darker tonality because it kind of just because that's the thing about like the whole wrestling thing is that it has to match your character. You're, you're like, you can't have you can't be like a, a, like an Alistair Black and come out with to like a fucking Nikki Bella song or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, it's important. So, um, yeah, like you wouldn't be JBL coming out to some like dirty, grimy, hardcore, right? Well, maybe. Nah, dude, JBL was always the proper dude. Yeah, but JBL also was Bradshaw from the APA, and they had that fucking, uh, mm. yeah, the, yeah. Tasty, tasty, tasty. Yeah. So, but yeah, so that's just a fun conversation we had last night, which I, I wanted to bring it in. I, I was actually listening to a po- an older podcast of ours, um, like in the 60s, and um, I want to bring back a game next week that I'm going to try to come up with fresh content. Oh, for. boy, what's the game? Can you announce it? Agree or disagree. I'm going to try to bring that back. Very cool. Oh, that's been gone for a while now. I think yeah. that got replaced with... Uh, Ten song Ten set list was would, the big one. Yeah, I think that was very cool. Yeah, you were you were asking to agree to disagree or agree or disagree last night, and I was like, oh man, this guy's formulating something. Yeah. Anyway, let's dive into the 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 meat and potatoes of today's agenda. Absolutely. Oh, let's go. Music news and reviews. So we got kind of a stack thing. Where do you want to start with this? Well, let's just do the this student order now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, First and foremost, obviously, we've talked about uh, Fire Fest and how it kind of had its whole flub and all that good stuff. And Woodstock, um, Woodstock fifty. Woodstock 50 has decided that they are going to cancel their show. They decided that they, well, they announced that they cannot be accountable for the safety and all that good stuff of all these people and all these bands. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the right way to go. Admitting, I don't, I don't even want to say defeat. They're saying it's not worth it. It's not worth it guys. Yeah. It's not because my dad was at the OG one 50 years ago and that was pretty rough. Yeah. That's what a lot of people were saying. They were like, well, 
blah 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 the legacy you ever was like you understand the legacy of the original Woodstock is that it was fucking a, a mess it was a mess it was hard to plan like it didn't go off perfect uh, like there was a lot of Far issues from. yeah there was a lot of issues with the whole planning of the original Woodstock and they're obviously they have the whole fucking lovey dovey like nostalgia glasses version of it it's romanticized it's yeah. grossly romanticized, yeah, romanticized but now word, it's yeah. like if you're dehydrated and you go to the hospital what are you gonna do man you're gonna flip around and sue yep and there's there's just too much media coverage of all this stuff and there's so many things that could go wrong and so many ways the law can be interpreted to turn this against the promoters yeah and I give them credit because like you said there, there's an, we, we've had a recent incident of somebody just going through because they needed to make money. Uh, and they're like, you know what? Not worth it. We're not going to ruin the name of Woodstock. We're not going to... I think that's the most important thing yeah. here because the safety of people, of course, comes first and foremost. But to shit on one of the most legendary concerts within the past hundred years yeah, would be such a disgrace. Absolutely. And I'm not saying the lineup is bad. The lineup's actually pretty solid, but it's the way everything is... Pulled and queued together. Yeah, and that's. Uh, I think they made the right move. Yeah, they did the right thing. 100%. It's unfortunate, but it's it's unfortunately good news. Yep, absolutely good. Shit. And I remember I saw the the fucking uh, Facebook thing. Everybody kept on posting picture of that one guy from the fire fest with the whole blowjob thing. Everybody <laughs> everybody kept on posting pictures of him. Poor guy. I don't know why he would admit that on, on fucking TV, but it is what it is. All right, moving along. So a little tour. So we talked about all the potential replacements for Z Whoop tour, right? Um, and then we said, well, I think a lot of these other smaller bands are going to come out in a package, right? And I, I even mentioned this that labels are going to come out are going to come out with their own package. Uh, yeah, absolutely. On, on a tour, and Pure Noise has done that. They have uh, brought maybe some of their 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 their, their top hitters, the big dogs. Yeah, some of their R- big run dogs. me through the lineup because this was pretty tasty. Yeah, so it is opening a uh, headliner. Stick to your guns, fucking fantastic. Uh, counterparts also fantastic. Those Ter- those two go together like peanut butter and jelly. Man. Absolutely. Uh, Terror, great, great band, great, great hardcore band. band. And these two, which we've talked about recently, Sanction. And year of the fucking knife, bro. Yep, that is a tasty, tasty lineup for the gir- dirty, grimy ass hardcore shows. And uh, I think it's gonna be a good. Yeah, good it's gonna show. bring all your basement dollars up. Yeah, they're coming here on the twenty fifth of uh, July. July at the Bottom Lounge. So it should be a good show. Should be good. I would like to see um, my version of the Hunger Games, where all the labels bring out their top dogs and their big competitors. That's what we talked about. Yeah, yeah. And I think that'd be a really proper idea because you're not only promoting your label and the bands on the label, but if if there was like quote unquote peace amongst the federations, like you know Pure Noise and UNFD and all those guys, I'm sure they they got good relations, right, with the Wookies. Um, that's one. But if they kind of came together and they said, "Hey, let's all pitch in and let's just do this shit at Tinley Park, like Warp Tour did," and we all there's like a you know a Pure Noise stage and there's a fucking UNFD stage and there's a Rise Records stage, and you just, people would go fucking bonkers. Imagine that. Imagine having like five bands off of Pure Noise, five bands off of fucking Rise Records, and five bands off of Sumerian, and all these crazy motherfuckers coming out put to your, just destroy. And put your best foot forward because like, well, you're not just representing yourself now. You're representing your, the label. You got to put your best foot forward and fucking kill the show. I think you. that would be the worst ever with time confliction if you had like five stages because yeah. then you're, you're really going to have to tear yourself yeah. apart. Yeah, definitely. Good shit. That, yeah, I think that that would be the next logical move. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see what happens moving forward. I hope more labels do this because there was a time like where Artery would do it and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember those Artery tours with like uh, the used and some 41 yeah. had a tour back to back. I was so, woo, back yeah. in the day. So we got that going and hopefully, like I said, more labels follow suit and go forward because this is a good lineup, man. It's, yeah, a, great, it's, a, it's a proper hardcore lineup. It's a great lineup. Uh, I love the the, the, the tour flyer. The poster. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely an art that goes into tour posters and this is a really good one absolutely so we'll see what happens moving forward with that but gr- great first step and like i said we have a few of these replacement tours and i'm feeling fulfilled i'm not feeling totally empty like i thought we would or yeah, feeling partially the, filled yeah. or feeling the, the void that's too um there so there, there's that going but uh yeah that's so it. Stuff, one man. of the bands or i'm sorry one of the albums we're highly looking forward to this year has had a single dropped off it, and of course we're talking about upon a burning body. Now you said Vato last metal. You said you had a strong opinion on this. What's what what's what's wrong? Oh, I just thought I had some words for it. Uh, yeah, words, you, words. You could go ahead and go first because I, I think you enjoyed it. I did. I liked it, man. Um, I'm kind of sad that they haven't gone full Vato metal because that's kinda... my big issue with it too. I think they pulled it off, and I think they did it really fucking well. And I think it's in between the Vato metal and the full blown like deathcore grimy Carlitos way shit that they came out with in the beginning. Yeah, and I think it's an okay single, but that's where it stops for me. 
Yeah. And that's unfortunate. Yeah, it, it didn't blow me away, but it's kind of more along the lines. Well, hey, this this is a a mid level upon a burning body song, and I was kind of hoping that we get blown away like with some of the the earlier stuff with uh like the the straight from the body stuff because that shit was like yeah oh, um fuck. you know we we've had these two kind of extremes of upon a burning body and they've shown that they could both do both really fucking well which yeah. is insane to me. I just kind of I don't want anything in between. Yeah, I, I I don't think average is what we should have got here. I, I think, I we think sh- you could even do like a Fato metal song and then go back to some dirty, grimy Robert Rodriguez titled <laughs> shit. Reference, yeah. Yeah, I think you could do like two, one, two, one in whatever order you fucking wanted and I'd be super satisfied, uh-huh. you know? Ooh, I got another game for next week. New you, Upon a Burning Body Tricks? No, 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 no. You take, uh, if you had to name your song titles based on a director's movies. What's all right? Let's rock and roll. We're yeah. gonna have some fun next week. Yeah, but yeah, that was my gripe with it, man. I don't think it's a bad single by any means, but it's in that okay field. And upon a, Bur- upon a burning body has no bad albums. Yeah. They have weaker album. They have a weaker album, just one. Which one are you thinking? Red, white, green. You I didn't like that one. I'm sorry. Or was it red, white, green? I hang on. I'm gonna pull up their discography because yeah, really you you were crisscrossing yesterday too. So yeah, I see. I get my shit fucked up. Yeah, but um. They don't have a bad album. They really don't. I even like um, tracks off the album that I'm thinking of that I can't fucking name right now. But this single, it was just a slight bit underwhelming. Yeah. For me. You know, I'd I would agree. The world is my enemy now. That is the album I'm thinking of, the 2014 one. Yeah. And that has bangers like Red Razor Wrist and Bring the Rain. Um, you know? Yeah. There's some good stuff on there. But Red, no. White, Green is probably my favorite one. Yeah. Um and straight from the body oh, yeah. it was really close second. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, and it, it's just kind of sad. I wanted a little more jalapenos in my single. I, li- I wanted a little more cilantro, some chorizo. Yeah. yeah, let me let me get a nice meaty chorizo single from yeah. Upon a Burning Body. Absolutely, that sounds so wrong in so many ways, <laughs> but it's not a bad single. You should check it out. Let us know yep. what you think. Yep. Um. We're, we're going to give the album a review. I think this is not one either of us are going to skip. No, absolutely not. Um, and we'll regroup. Maybe we'll be delightfully surprised because yep. I know you were pretty underwhelmed by that Silent Planet single last year. Uh, I was. Northern Fire. And but then, then it, when the album dropped, you were like, never mind. Yeah, that shit blew, my, blew me away. I, yeah. In, so in we, we got to take it as a whole, you yep. know, good stuff. Absolutely. So next up, we have a rap topic for once. Now, it's so, very, very uh, rarely do we cover rap on this pod, at least me. But I actually beat you to this one. Yeah. Um. So uh, I want to apologize to everybody out there. First of all, I, I put Jake on with Logic a while ago when he dropped the Young Sinatra. Was it five or four? Four. Yeah. Four that he dropped last year, and Jake was like, "Oh, it's pretty good, pretty good." Yeah. And yeah. then so Logic did a finally a feature with Oops. the big guy, the big dog Eminem, and they dropped the song called Homicide on Friday. Yep. And it's pretty fucking good, actually. Absolutely. So I do have a complaint. Mm-hmm. Now my only real complaint with it is it doesn't exactly feel like a song. It feels like two guys. Like a dialogue, right? It's, yeah, it's, it sounds like two guys who are d- dropping their, their best bars at the moment. and It feels almost like a rap battle, but they're working yeah, together. They're, yeah, they're, they're not against each other, but they're like, you know what? Let's see who, see who, can, who what you got as far as like dropping bars. And um, I just wish there was more of a traditional song. That's like my only complaint. I, I wish there was something in between. Well, I think both artists kind of push that envelope of what a song is. Yeah, that's true. And a lot of the stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm more of a, in recent memory, I'm more of a Logic fan because his albums, his like real albums are like really good and they're really artistic and expressionary and they tell a beautiful story. But Eminem's always pushed the envelope of what the rap game is. And his albums have always been phenomenal. Like, you know, Marshall Mathers LP, fucking great. And I, I think this coming together is okay that it doesn't feel like a traditional song. My thing is that it neither feels like an Eminem song nor a Logic song. If you were to ask me to categorize it, I'd be like, well, this is its kind of own weird yeah. collab. Because it doesn't feel like a Logic song. It doesn't feel like an Eminem song to me. Because it, it really yeah. does feel like... We're, who is going to... Is, is it going to be like Kendrick Lamar and like Young Thug that come back? You know, it feels like we're waiting for a response from somebody like a, from another two people, right? Yeah. It feels like that, doesn't it? It's like, it's not like a, like I said, it's not in like in a in a bad taste or like a uh, anger written place. They're like, okay, this is our best to see. Who, let's see who could come out there and and do something else. Yeah, it's a it's a tag team match. Is what yeah. it feels like. Yeah, absolutely. And we still don't know who the opponents are. Yeah, so um, I like like I said, I liked. It. It's just my only complaint. I wish I was a little bit more of a traditional song. I wish there was a hook, and I think the only hook is chicka chicka chicka. I think that's like the I only, think that's hilarious. I think it's like the only hook in, in the song. 
hook in, in the non-traditional sense, obviously. Um, I love how he references Eminem right before he comes in, I, in like a couple different ways. I thought it was fucking hilarious. Yeah, so that was cool. Uh, I, you know what I love about the song that it ends abruptly, and it's like that dude that Facebook video online where the guy's like pam again, pam again. He pretend like he was fucking you know rapping <laughs> yeah. like Eminem. And I told Adriana, I'm like that was like hysterical. I fucking I, I literally laughed out loud when I heard that. And then I played it for her. She's like, yeah, that was funny because he was like pam again, pam again, man again, pam again. Dranigan. like that whole thing <laughs> i liked it that's a good song and uh i'm gonna because logic you know if he got something gearing up this year which obviously i think he came out with another single he came out with a book a few months ago he came out with the single he came out with bobby Ter- or young sinatra and i think we're due for like the big album now this dude is always busy he is like the white childish gambino he's always doing something <laughs> you've made that reference twice about two no he, he really he you don't understand he really is because when this dude blew up he had one two three four five like six or seven mixtapes out yeah. and a bunch of features and this and that and and when under pressure his first like mainstream album came out whoo took took way the fuck off look yeah. through his discography when you get a chance on itunes and you'll be like he did how much since 2012 <laughs> right no so yeah i guess we'll see uh, what he got coming out uh logic might be one of those guys who end up on the He's he's been keeping busy, man. Yeah, and he's good. And if you haven't done a deep dive on Logic, you should now. Yep, because he's got some bangers out there. Absolutely, good stuff. I wish the metal community was more more accepting of these kind of collaborations, because I feel like a lot of the times you get like the lead singer of X band joining Y band, mm-hmm. and it's okay most of the time. I want to see a lot more collab though with like a whole band collab. Ooh, that's, another, that's another game. You know, play. like what if you took Danny Leal and you put him in like a fucking like an Every Time I Die or like a Knocked Loose song? Woo! Ooh. Tasty, tasty, tasty. Yeah, you know, because I feel like we got a, a like. Like you said, there was an era where like it would happen a lot where we get like like you said the vocalist from Y to Gordon Z, uh, and you get a lot of that live though for sure. Like you didn't really see a lot of uh, like a ton of it, but like you see a lot of it. Oh, live. Warped Tour all the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I'm saying I I kind of want. I'm not saying I want a feature per album, but I'm saying it'd be nice if uh, a lot of the features would be a little more present. Mm-hmm. Even if it's a single, I think uh, Straight from the Path does a really good job. They had like three features on their last album. Yeah, and, th- and it wasn't even just like uh, guys from the scene. They had that 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 rapper on there that did like a really good song. Oh, that's um, uh, you're like an album behind. Yeah, no, no, I know, but I'm saying, but that, even that album had yeah. like well, they had like Sam Carter, that guy, and, yeah. and then on the album after that, they had Keith Buckley, they had Ryan Garris, and uh, some other dude who album, I can't recall. Album, album before they had Jason Butler, and all yeah, that. it's good stuff, man. I, I like to see stuff like that. Yeah, me too. Good I think stuff. It's fun. I think it's fun, but yeah, so. Yeah, there's that. Moving along. All right, you ready for this uh, powerhouse of a review? We'll All right, so you ready for this? Yeah, let's go. I actually, I'm doing two this week, and I put a lot of time into, I don't want to say a lot of time, I put a lot of uh, thought into both these albums. Uh, one of them is High Crimes by The Damn Things. And so for those of you who don't know, this is a super group with Keith Buckley from Every Time I Die, the guitarist from Anthrax, a whole bunch of other people. Scott Ian, he has a name. Scott Ian, yeah, I'm sorry. Show some respect. Uh, one of the Fallout Boy members, and it's, it's crazy. It's yeah. crazy how many people are in this group. So Absolutely. Um, All right. Well, if you ask me if what my favorite Keith Buckley project is, it's going to be a no-brainer. It's going to be Every Time I Die. And they just recently celebrated the 20 Years of Bullshit tour last year. Um, And they're on like this short little break now, which is fine. So the super group known as Damn Things is is they're cranking out some really good quality rock and roll. Uh, first and foremost, Keith's singing voice is fucking great. I almost forgot how great he sings because Sever- you're so used to the in your face guttural screaming. Severely underrated. Clean yeah, uh, like you know you look you listen to low teens and it's just like pipe bursting lows and shit like this. He's crazy range. He really does. And you're like, wow, this is phenomenal. But hearing him almost like step back from that and like this melodicness in his voice. And like, there's like this tinge of rust that I love and it's so good. It just flows so well. Um, I think this album shows what it really means to be a super group. So every like little nook and cranny of these songs are like beautifully polished from the transitions being super organic and seamless to the way these songs build in momentum. It, it's meticulous. The crafting of these pieces is really meticulous is what I'm getting at here. Uh, the album production isn't exactly in your face. Um, so no particular instrument or vocals are in the forefront of the song. And I initially didn't really know what to put about this. And so then it kind of hit me. I was like, well, that's the beauty of it, that it's not in your face, that there's no grimy blast beats pumping through your eardrums. And that's what really makes uh, this neutral production of this album. That's what really makes everybody shine through because it's not Keith Buckley starring. It's not Scott Ian starring. It is the damn things as a whole. And this is one of those things where it falls in the lines of Vanna, where the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. Is that the right expression? Sum is greater than its parts. There you go. 
Uh, and th High Crimes really benefits nicely from that neutral sound production because you could hear every little guitar hammer note and purple str strum of the bass being heard. Um, and like I said, man, because it's so neutral on this production, everything shines through. And it's, it's really a joy to listen to. Final Verdict, 7.5. It's a really good album. It's a really good album. And has any album broke more than a 7? Here's my thing, <laughs> and I've gone over this before. I review things I like, with the exception of the big ones. Because if somebody like, like your Bring Me the Horizon review, right? That wasn't really a review. It was it, a review. It sucked. We, we, we can't, like, we can't <laughs> skip a beast like that. Yeah. But otherwise, why would I waste my time and their time? These listeners' time, right? I'm going to review things I like. I'm going to review things that I recommend and things you should maybe put on in the background when you're doing some stuff, you know, when you're driving, when you're working. And but, that's why I do these reviews. But I'm saying, has anything gotten higher than a seven for you this year? Something's about to get higher than a seven. Oh, God. Here we go. Here we go. Ladies Part and two. Gentlemen. Here we go. So, uh, this other album, it's called Piss Poor by a band called Fever War. All right. Let's get into it. So this album has a very noticeable southern influence sound infused with dirty hardcore vocals. Yep. Oh, man. So what immediately struck me about this album is the energy and the ambiance that the music creates. The opening track, Warmer Winter, is a testament to the winter blues. It opens up with that tasty, tasty riff that makes you feel like you're sitting in front of a nice warm fire and describes the typical snow shenanigans. Uh, I really appreciate this because with the Chicago weather finally breaking through and being consistently nice, many people are shaking off that seasonal depression. Don't laugh at it. It's real. Um, so and it's kicking back into high gear. You notice your higher energy. You're feeling better when the sun's out and shit like that. Uh, and this song is like perfectly exemplifies that feeling of breaking through the dark, gloomy winter months into the nice, bright summer shit. You got something to say? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just saying, I'm super happy that you actually wrote this stuff down. Go yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so I think Fever War brings the heat with piss poor instrument. The instrumental work isn't over the top, but by no means does it have to be with Southern rock like this. What's in, I don't know when you're going to interrupt me or not. You're like, edging no, towards the mic. no, 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 just, I want you to yeah, keep going. Sure. So what is important is the layers and layers of effects and sound production. The production is crystal clear and it really highlights some of the sparkles and undertones of the bass and guitar. I think that's really important, especially when you're going for the Southern rock aesthetic. Um, so speaking about aesthetic, this album, it, it like, it has that big dirty aesthetic that every time I die did, uh, in one of the songs called, uh, permanent fix the opening of that song. I did like stop myself and be like, when did I start listening to every time I die? Cause that opening is very Jordan Buckley, Andy Williams type, type of shit, you know? And I was like, seriously, I had to be like, wait, hang on. Is this thing over. Or did I transition? Um, so here's my food comparison. So I like doing these <laughs> okay, yeah, the albums. Yeah. This album is like Nashville hot chick. <laughs> 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 that chicken is battered up and seasoned beautifully. Part of the appeal of <laughs> Nashville hot chicken is, of course, the chicken, but the other big one is the flavor and heat. Piss poor leaves this flavor of intensity and heat in your mouth that keeps you coming back for another listen and another. 8.5, album of the year so far, because this is the first thing that's truly blown me away. Okay. And it's kind of sad. N not this album, but last year we had a very clear contender from February all the way up to August, and, and stayed, that was that was disposed by the plot and you. It stayed on our list, too. And it's this album dropped officially on May 3rd, and this like I had some I had some thoughts about what's gonna be in first and second. This one clearly knocks everything down, and they did a fucking great job at it. So I I gave this a listen. I mean, I, I, honestly, dude, it's not long enough to be an album. It is kind of an EP. It's twenty five minutes. That's, that's I know. A, that's and an and is it is it weird that we've seen that this is becoming the trend, or maybe yeah. that we've been picking and choosing things that are a little bit shorter? I mean. I guess I don't know. I, I like albums that feel like albums. I, I want to. Uh, we like that big majesty, the <laughs> overarching story. Yeah. But w what did you think of it overall? Aside from it being a short, <laughs> give me, give me, give me. Oh no, he just got a coke. He's about to go ape shit on this album a, review. A, a Coca Cola, not a not 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 not. Okay, Sorry, okay. Go. So so what did you think of it aside from the length? Because that is kind of my one complaint about it too. So I mean, I, I'm not. I didn't do it as deep of a dive as you did because I knew that you were gonna go fucking go in. So. Gabe has a very particular set of things that he likes, right? What you, do I like? You like that fucking Southern rock vibe, bro. You, you mentioned it yesterday, and I asked Maddie, and she's like, yeah. Yeah, and I, I wonder what it is. I mean, I, see, I like I said, I did it maybe like three. I've got three songs in, and I'm like, man, this is cool. I like it. It's interesting. It's dynamic. And it's very not very often that you come across something who does something interesting and dynamic in the scene of music because there's a lot of the run of the mill there's of, a lot of templates out there yeah there's a lot there's a lot of a stuff lot out of there. vanilla metalcore yeah like we, we talked about i prevail and that was kind of interesting and dynamic right because it did something a little bit different these guys 
it's not just the the southern rock vibe because it definitely had that but the production is so classic rock to me it's but such old school rock and roll it, it has all the same values and all the same attributes that should be in a classic rock song but it's crystal fucking clear do yeah. you know how awesome that is yeah it's like listening to like like a remastered Aerosmith album. That's what that's, that's what, what I was it feels going. like. Uh, it looked like you took Zeppelin and Zeppelin's like, you know what? Let's remaster this, and then that's what it sounds. And like. And Zeppelin was like, let's make some fucking moonshine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I really like this thing. I think um, the creativity of this band shines through because we did the single review um, Porch Mouth when it came out, and you, I told you to listen to some of their other like older stuff, and you're like, well, it sounds like a hardcore band that's kind of in between the mills right now, and. I truly believe that with these two albums and some of the other bands that I'm expecting to drop stuff right now, we're going to see a rock revival in the scene because rock music's been out. And which I'm glad. I'm so fucking glad that it's been out. But if more rock music was like this album, holy shit, I ain't going back to metalcore. <laughs> well, maybe that's a lie. But yeah. seriously, though, this thing is really proper. Yeah. And to address your length concern, yeah, I get it. 25 minutes. But I think this album does what it needs to do and it gets out. It doesn't linger. It doesn't loiter. Hmm. And I would have liked more. But this band is kind of still in its infancy, and I'm gonna pay close attention. I'm gonna I'm gonna invest a little. Where do you think they're from? Duh, you can't even fucking tell anymore because. Where do you think they're from? Just take a wild guess off the top of your head. Don't even think about it. Where do you think they're from? South Carolina. South Carolina is a fair guess. My first guess was Kentucky. They're actually out of Ohio. Them, Lost Boys Collective, Double Wears Prada, uh, Attack Attack, uh, all these. What are they feeding people in Ohio to crank out good metalcore like that? I don't know, dude. That in Australia, man. There's just a lot of fuck. There's something in the water. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really like this thing, as you can tell, because I usually... I'll do a paragraph of a review if I, if I enjoy it, but I think I kind of went and I took my time crafting this review. So, I, I see, because you've had some albums that you were like, really... I'm not, I, have, I mean, outside of like Billie Eilish... And which is weird because who would have thought? Um, who would have thunk it, right? Yeah, uh, I haven't really come across something that's really kind of we we got me excited. Like I said, we got late releases this year, is what I feel like. Maybe it's not us because we have a lot of late releases. Last year was like mid-year releases, with the exception of you know the plot and you and uh, Under Oath and Under Oath, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, like a lot of October and like August stuff that we had happened last Ice year. Ice Nine, Silent yeah. Planet, yeah, um, Architects. Yeah, yeah, we had a lot of heavy late year releases, and this year I feel like it's a lot of mid year releases because we're gonna have upon a burning body in a month. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have Slipknot in like six, seven weeks. Okay. It's you know, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave the review for the review, but it's still a big release. Yeah, we're we're talk, still gonna do it. Yeah, we'll still talk about it. Yeah. Uh, Devil Wears Prada. I'm still planning for like a November release. I think yeah. that's very feasible. And I, you know, I sent you that new track. Yeah. Uh, Want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's go over it. What'd you think about it? So, um. For those of you who are wondering, this isn't officially out. This isn't officially released. Somebody caught it at the Newark, New Jersey show. Um, this is the New Jersey show that they're doing for with Roots Above, Branches Below. Mm -hmm. And somebody recorded it on their phone, tossed it up on Twitter. Yeah, so the, my only really impression of it is that I'm like, man, there's a lot of guys with long hairs in this band now. <laughs> I mean, They're a bit older. Yeah, it's, it sounds good. Um, I like the breakdown. Yeah, it's it's hard to because like when it comes to like uh, off recordings for live stuff, it's hard to kind of catch gauge that, it. Yeah, you catch that kind of ambiance for you it. You know what the Devil Wears Prada does with their production, mm -hmm. and you know what they do. Actually, you can't even say that anymore. You can't. Oh yeah, because the Transit Blues is kind of left field. And yeah, trans well, because like you had that very robotic kind of sound that they originally had when they first came out, and then you had that really organic, fucking violent kind of vibe that it came out in the between. And now, like you said, Transit Blues is kind of that oddball kind of it's, a thing. It, I don't even think it has metalcore production on it. Really, I think there's elements of metalcore production on it, but it's definitely produced like. I'll give it another listen through, and I'll, I'll give you a little clearer definition. But even transitioning from Dead Throne to Space EP, Space EP has a lot of fat fucking like bass in your face, and the clarity on the drums is insane, really, with all those sound effects going on. Mm -hmm. And it really, the production on that EP was great because it did make you feel like it was in space. Yep. So that being said, I think the Devil Wears Prada knows when to step in when it comes to their production and how the album sounds as a whole. The acoustic values of that album, if and that makes it, sense. And it's, it's, a, it's an extension of the creativity of the, the aesthetic of the artwork itself. Because like, there there was a phase with that Jerry Sturgis phase where every band sounded exactly the same. And yeah, no, we covered this. So like, and they were one of those bands and it's like they took a step forward with the storytelling and translated that to the production. Like, well, the production has to sound like the, the story that we're telling. The production has to sound like you're looking at the album cover, if that makes sense. No, I like that. That's good. Yeah, because you look at Space EP, it makes sense. You look at Zombies. Um, fun fact, I drive past one of those big-ass like, power towers. You see it every time? And 
Is that on 79? No, this is like uh, on one of the exits I take off the highway, but like I'll pass by it and I won't think anything. But this one day it was like really like gloomy out and yeah. I had that like gray filter. I was like, oh, that here's hit. where it started. Yeah. Oh, wait, never mind. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. It, the album has to sound like what you're looking at. Yeah, I agree. And that's why Transit Blues looks kind of airy and, and uh, light, fluffy, light. I want to no. say light spaced out, maybe. I have to, the production to, doesn't step over the music. We, we have to dig because, like, I, I, you know what I like about because one of the best episodes we ever did as far as reviewing music was an album that we did that was ten years old. That what was, was that. Bring me the horizon. We did such a great job with that, and I want to take albums that maybe necessarily I don't want to say missed the mark, but when we talked about it initially, we like it was here, here, and there. I want to do a deeper dive on some of the older stuff. So like, yeah, let's do a retro review on something. I, I've already, album. I picked one for next week already off the top of my head. And I'm doing a re-review of erase me by under Oath next week because I've really dove in. And cause maybe cause I, I've watched the, the making of that album multiple times and there's stuff in here that I didn't hear. Through on the, initial, through my first several walkthroughs of the album. And by the end of last year, it made my cut but I think if we were to redo that list, it would probably be like a step or two higher on cool. my list. Um, I think it's a, it goes to show because you have your Under Oath fabric poster hanging, but you don't have the Devil Wears Prada poster I got you hanging. I don't know. How, I, <laughs> I, I, I got I to get like a no, actual. No, I still got a frame mine. Don't even yeah. sweat it. I just thought it was a funny joke. Yeah, I, I got to get it up because like I don't want to like put tax in it. You know what I mean? I don't want to do that. Is that what you tell your wife? Yeah. Cool. You don't want to put tax in Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. But, but uh, so yeah, yeah, we should do a retro review, whether that be a movie or an album. Yeah, and maybe that should instead well, of the ten song set list. Because we've done that like a couple. We did the American Pie one, which was a great conversation. I did Underworld, which is pretty good. Um, I, I like the retro review stuff that we do. I think it's, the Mummy. We had a great conversation about the Mummy. Yeah, it was a bit spaced because we watched it like months apart. But yeah, yeah we had a good chat about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we should maybe settle on something. And then do a retro. I will, th- that if let's both do it then. Let's both do under Oath next right, week. I'll, I'll give it a Re- fair try. Gabe, I need you to remove your. I have nothing against under Oath. I just think what I was looking for at the time wasn't what they were delivering, and that's not in an under Oath perspective. That's in a music perspective. If mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, I get you. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, like you. I love lasagna. I fucking love lasagna. And you know what? That's a bad example because I could totally slam a piece of lasagna right now. <laughs> I love like a like a gyro, right? But if you brought out a gyro right now, I'd be like, ah, I'm okay. Because I ain't really feeling a gyro. There's nothing wrong with that. I still love gyros. Yeah. Absolutely. Under Oath is like the gyros of the metal. No, we're not going to get into yeah, that don't, don't, do, don't do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man, I think just to kind of sum up this album, uh, we always bring it up. There is an abundance of bands that we keep up with, and there is an abundance of bands that we expect great things from. Ponic Burning Body is one of them. Devil Wears Prada is one of them. We're still waiting for that release later this year. Mm-hmm. But it's always the bands that come out of nowhere that fucking grab you and they shake your list and everything comes falling apart. Because last year, who was it for you? It was uh, Glass Hands. Yeah, and Harm's Way was up there for a while too. Yeah, and they've they've gotten exponentially bigger since that review. Yeah, but they just came out of nowhere and Jamie fucking tackled you. And yeah, then, dude, I, I'll even want he would he would get the better of me for sure. He would he would do stuff to me that I wouldn't even like want to do. But it's always those bands that come out of left field and they just shake everything up in your musical perspective not that was fever work for me not only will i do what what like i wouldn't want to do but i would feel like immediately like sympathetic and be like man i just would like want to know if it was just as good for you as as it was for me you know what i mean yeah (laughs) yeah back on the james thing well all right like like in retrospective 2017 it should have been it was august burns red right because i settled on that but if i were to go back and change it which i can't granted but if i were to reevaluate that it would have been polaris uh, that Polaris album. Yeah, go ahead. Code Orange for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because both those bands came out of left field and both those bands dropped grade A albums. 2018 should have been great American Ghost. Well, that would have been number two. I don't even think it made the cut. No. Because it was still, it's still Silent Planet for me. But that would have been a very close two. Because yeah. that album, ugh, the more I listen to it, the more I love it. And this year, Fever War. We're going we're gonna to see how far we take Fever War. But it's a number one album of the year for me right now. Uh, right now, I'm looking at Dayseeker as kind of being like my, my next one. To see Your next big of, one? Yeah, see how, see how that looks like. Yeah, I'm excited for that. And I think Thousand Blows do too. Yeah, that would be good. That's going to be a good review. Yeah. And what's what's going on with Bad Omens? I thought they had something going on. And, and They've been kind of quiet. Did they drop? Did they drop? No, I don't, I don't think they, they're dropping. I think they're product, in production right now. Okay. Yeah. Post. Post. Is, is that post production or is that movies is post production? Can we say the same about albums? No. No, no it's just well, production. What's the production? Cool. Mixing, I guess that's kind of production. Uh, Northern Ghost. 
Can't yeah. wait for that one. Yeah, that, that'd they're be all good. due. The 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 holy trinity of the new metal force core is. This is the year that the Titans leave the ground because this planet's have aligned. <laughs> what is this? The fucking Hercules. That was movie? Hercules. Yeah, that was Hercules. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we should do a retro review on that. Hey, don't fucking get me started. I love Hercules. I do too. All right, uh, really quick, last topic. I want to wrap this up, and you you brought him up, so I want to talk about it. What do you think would win? Um, Tim Lambis is in his prime, or Jamie from Harm's Way? We talked about currently it. his we, current state. We talked about this. Uh, it would have to be Jamie because I don't. I think he's a hundred and fifty percent organic. I think he just eats a fucking twenty ounce. He's steak. a massive dude. He eats a twenty ounce steak every single morning. I think with like <laughs> seven or eight eggs. <laughs> he doesn't even bother smoking his cigarettes. He says toss them in there. Yeah, he just fucking eats him. So that, I honestly I think Jamie because Tim was a big guy. But he wasn't like because you know you know what brought this up. I was watching the Suicide Silence tribute to Mitch Lucker thing. I rewatched that, and Tim Lambesis came out for one of the songs, and I was like, he is very inverted triangle shape it, when he when he was like twenty twelve thirteen era. He was very like inverted, like almost cartoonish. You know, I agree. With but that. when you look at Jamie from Harm's he's Lake, like a solid. He's like a fucking tree. He's just fucking. He's big. like a pillar, bro. He's, he's like a, just a giant column at like your fucking, library. And he's fucking carved up. What? Just like, like those one those uh, columns at like the government buildings in DC. He's one of those. You go to fucking the Few Museum. You pull out one of those. That's a that's what he is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys like hardcore? <laughs> yeah. If I did it now, I do. Yeah. Good shit. Yeah, I thought that was a fun little chat. You All got right. anything you want to wrap it up with? No, other than the fact that I have like one thing that I want everybody to check out, and I didn't really get a chance to talk about it, but um. What's the name? After the Burial had a new song that came out. It's called Influx. Influx? Influx. It's fucking sick. Check it out. Other than that, we'll see you next week for episode 117 of the Second City Kids podcast. Uh, we will be doing a retro review of Under Oath, Erase Me, and uh, we'll get into that and hopefully have a good conversation about it. And, but until then, you can go ahead and like us on all the places that you can find your iTunes, all the places that you love. We're there. We exist. Uh, and all that good stuff. And until then, we'll see you. Deuces.